Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, we're really excited today to be here with Kate Fernandez, who is the Global Director, I hope I'm getting this right, Global <laughs> Director of Global Brand Marketing at Linky Lux. Um, I'm Maddie Buris. Um, I'm on the marketing team here at Castora. And before we jump in to talking about the rise of Instagram native retail, just a really quick um, a really quick recap of what Castora is for those of you on the webinar who don't already know. So we're a customer analytics solution and we work with over 100 global retail brands, helping them to acquire, retain um, customers and grow lifetime value. Um, so we work with some really amazing brands, one of which is Winky Lux. Um, so welcome, Kate. Hey, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. It's always a good morning when I start Castora, whether I'm at your office or at my office. And we're really excited you were able to be here. She's been traveling constantly for work. I've heard from Shop Talk in Vegas, just got back from Nashville, launching pop-up stores. Yes, it's it's been fun. Nashville is great. Um, we just opened up our fifth experience store in Nashville. So you can check us out at hashtag Winky Lux Nash on Instagram and check out all the fun posts from our opening party that we just had. Was it yesterday? No, Monday. You're like, What's can't even remember. Today? today is Wednesday. <laughs> Awesome. So, Kate, can you tell us a little bit about you and your career path leading up to Winky Lux? Yep. Um, I started on e-commerce. So, um, I was actually a copywriter first and then moved into email marketing management. Um, so, I've always kind of had some vigor for great segmentation and data analytics and things like that, um, but with a flair um, for content or kind of a flair for content. And, well, Makes you sense. get what I mean. Um, and yeah, since then, um, I've been in and out, um, uh, in house. I've been at digital agencies. Um, I dabbled a bit in some dashboard building. Um, and now I'm at Winky Lux and it's about to be two years. I was employee number seven. So it's been great to see the super fast growth, um, at Winky Lux and I'm very excited. Awesome. Can you tell us a little bit about Winky Lux? Yeah, so Winky Lux launched in October of 2015. Um, we're an Instagram brand. We were born on Instagram. We launched at BeautyCon, which I think was super fun. It was, a, at that time, um, the number one way to discover indie beauty brands. And I mean, it still continues to be. Um, Winky Lux, I mean, we're, we're still pretty small, just under four years. We have about 40 employees, not including our store staff. And in August of 2018, um, we decided to try our hand at physical experience stores. And when I say experience store, I mean retail in the front and Instagrammable rooms in the back. Um, so all of the rooms are dedicated to specific products. They're abstract celebrations of the product. That's awesome. And you guys are based here in New York City, correct? Yes, we're in the Lower East Side because we're that hip. Very hip. The I heard you have pink of, walls. We do. Pink walls, puppies, and a lot of happy hour spots nearby. I love it. It's very on brand. Yeah, I would say so. <laughs> cool. So my understanding is that from the very beginning, um, you guys have leveraged a micro influencer strategy for a more down to earth and cost efficient type of social media presence. Um, can you tell us about that? Tell us what it means to be a social media first brand. I mean, I think to me, it means putting your followers first. Um, when you're a social media first brand, you're pretty vulnerable. Your community is helping you make decisions and validating them in public for everyone to see, which can be great and sometimes pretty scary. Um, being social first also allows us to just be more nimble and we're all about that flexibility. We're super fast brand um, and everything that we do from product development to you know getting the feedback from our consumers online and changing our messaging and even product formulas. Awesome. So the beauty space has really exploded, I feel, in the past 10 years with tons of new brands um, launching. Can you tell us about how you guys kind of found your niche, how you identified a market, um, target market that wasn't really being catered to um, in the beauty space? It's really funny. So I think Natalie and Nate, our founders, could probably um, tell the story a little bit better since I wasn't physically there. But I know that back in 2014, when they were first joining first uh, forces and figuring out what they wanted to do together, they were actually building an app that would allow um, shoppers, beauty shoppers, to find products more easily and to curate online, which I think a lot of apps like that were kind of happening in 2013, 2014. Um, and they brought in girls between the ages of 16 through 
35 to dump out their makeup bags and tell them, where did you buy this? What did you, what do you feel about your makeup? Like, what do you like about shopping for makeup? Um, and they found that one, nobody was really interested in the app. Um, but two, um, they weren't really happy with the products that they could afford. They wanted, you know, all of the pretty things, which is actually something that we say all the pretty things um, quite often. But they were holding up pieces like their Charlotte Tilbury lipstick, their Tom Ford lipstick, their Dior mascara, and they were super excited about this. Um, but when it came to their drugstore makeup, which I mean, I can I can say I have a lot of drugstore makeup, um, they were almost ashamed to talk about it. So uh, that was interesting, and they discovered, okay, uh, there's a void, um, there's this gap in the industry where it's, you know, not luxury feel at drugstore prices. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I've definitely seen that. I feel like more and more people are, they're afraid to say they buy drugstore makeup. And yeah. I mean, there are so many brands now, so many luxury brands, but I feel like people want luxury at a, yeah, you know, but that's at also a not, that's nice, at a price that's nice and that doesn't make it feel like exclusive. And, and sometimes with feel. drugstore makeup, you uh, miss out on the opportunity for trends. I think drugstore mm -hmm. makeup can be a little behind on the trends and that's why people kind yeah. of look to the luxury. So that was kind of the second thing um, that came out of that, us kind of figuring out that they want trends fast and they want to be able to afford them. Mm -hmm. So being a social media brand, I know you guys um, use influ influencers very heavily in your marketing strategy. How do you guys decide which influencers are right for your brand? Well, we're really lucky and that a lot of them come to us. Um, our team pretty much hand vests and hand selects every single influencer that's currently in our network. Um, one of the, a fun fact is that all of our social media managers or directors have been influencers themselves. Um, so a lot of them pull from their personal network, which is great for us because that means you yeah. don't have to do all that extra heavy lifting. Um, but we're always looking for someone that's on brand, and by on brand, I mean, you know, they have an authentic love for Winky Lux. Um, their content aesthetic and quality is up to par with something that we would create in house. Um, and you know, obviously, follower count and engagement rate is very important. Um, as we grow, we are looking for ways to help us uh, move this process along more quickly. Um, we're always trying to work with new talent um, just to keep things fresh. Awesome. And do you think that your followers, your consumers can tell when an influencer is not authentic? Like that's, I assume, totally. something very important. I mean, I think if she's never talked about it before if she's not a makeup wearer or if she for example i mean i think winky Lux girl is somewhere in between that um that girl that really loves instagram makeup you know mm -hmm. so like the super harsh eye um look. got a lovely image yeah. of it here <laughs> yes yes so uh, oh that's actually one of the influencers that we work with really closely gandalf sandwich um really she cool. creates all of our beautiful eye looks we actually work with her a lot um, yeah, so she's somewhere in between there where she loves that. She probably isn't going to be wearing that on a daily. Like she's probably not, um, she's like me. I put my eyeshadow on with my finger. Mm -hmm. So um, it's like, she's a makeup enthusiast. She loves the makeup look. She's kind of a novice, but she's also not that super polished, like model off duty. Yeah. I just wear mascara and a <laughs> moisturizer. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how you guys are using customer intelligence to inform the direction of your branding and content. How do you guys incorporate customer intelligence? I have to ask this being Castora. <laughs> I mean, I think um, before we had Castora, we've always thought we've, we knew our demo, um, but being able to dig deeper into the smaller segments that at first sight don't appear to be who she or he is and discover ways to keep on brand, but modifying the content to speak to these groups is more powerful um, than, I mean, we ever knew because we didn't have the data. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'm assuming yeah. you guys don't have a data science team being a super we small team. We do not have a data science team, sadly. Um, so having information like this at our fingertips is super helpful um, for lean companies and startups who don't have um, you know, data scientists, analytics teams. Mm -hmm. um, so the dashboard group is very, very helpful. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. And how do you guys measure the ROI of a given social channel or campaign? I see usual suspects, revenue, engagement, reach, impressions, you know. 
pretty simple. Yeah, so you use Google Analytics. Yeah, we use Google Analytics. We're using Dash Hudson. So Dash Hudson is our, our social media um, dashboard and platform. And then obviously, this all gets threaded through um, this place is like a store. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't ask her to say that. Um, so yesterday, our office was really talking about the new Instagram checkout feature, um, which for those of you who haven't heard um, brands, it's in beta, I think, right now. But there's a new feature where customers can now check out directly on Instagram within the app without having to exit the app and go to a retailer's website. Um, is this exciting to you guys? How are you feeling about it? Definitely. Um, there was some chatter on Slack about it yesterday. Um, and our, you know, our social media director and I were away at our opening. Again, if you didn't hear that hashtag, it's hashtag Winky Lux Nash. <laughs> Check it out. Um, so we haven't had a chance to sit down alongside our new e-commerce director and discuss next steps. But um, I know this has been a long time coming and being an Instagram heavy brand, I'm really excited to see how this will impact revenue. Um, shopping tags were huge for us, um, really helping us drive conversions. And I imagine the transition will be an easy one, um, at least on the consumer side. Let's just see what those fees are like. Yeah, <laughs> they have not made that public yeah. yet. Um, awesome. So now I want to talk a little bit more about how Winky Lux is using customer intelligence. So we read an article in Forbes that talks about how your successful line of matcha infused products came to be um, by an intern just manually scanning um, Instagram, BuzzFeed, Pop Sugar, and Refinery29 to find new trends. Um, what does the Winky Lux R&D process look like now? Yeah, um, our matcha bomb was born from a lot of manual research. Um, it was also made reality because of our followers on social media. Um, a fun story is our, our CEO went to, to Instagram story um, when we received the prototype at a product development meeting. And it's just like, okay, guys, brace yourselves and going on um, and just flat out, flat out asked, do you want this? You know, she applied it, she explained what the product was. Um, and the majority of our followers did want it. Mm -hmm. um, I would say our research and development process has gotten a bit more advanced as we've grown and acquired new tools, cough, cough, Castora, um, <laughs> that help us understand what's working and what isn't um, in our current product line. Um, so yeah. That's awesome. And do you guys have interns just continuously scanning Instagram looking for the latest trends? We sure do. We have, <laughs> we have several interns that on in different departments that look at it. I think it's important. Um, and it's not just interns. I mean, during our product development process, we can find inspiration from so many different places. Um, my favorite is just kind of looking at different departments, like our operations team that you wouldn't normally uh, think at a traditional company to look to for, for uh, ideas. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. We definitely do. We, we like to keep things manual. That's I think awesome. it's just the startup in us. Yeah, we totally understand. <laughs> cool. So how much is driven by data-driven analytics versus human intuition and trend spotting? How do you guys balance those two things? Yeah, I mean, oddly, like I, like I just said, we are fans of the manual work. I think, you know, we just like to torture ourselves. Um, but I want to say that we're at an even 50-50 split now when it comes to data versus intuition. Numbers don't lie, but gut instincts is what really allows us to innovate. Um, we don't have data on things that don't exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you don't know what you don't know. I, it reminds me of Apple when you say that. Yeah. I'm thinking of that, you're very Steve Jobs-like. Oh, well, I do love a good turtleneck. <laughs> so how does data inform your product line in general? I have a favorite story on how consumer data we found on Castora played a major role in a product line decision. Um, one of our OG products, the Glossy Boss, our third product, I believe, was in-house. It was an in-house favorite. Um, I love it. It's super moisturizing. Get yourself one. Get one for your loved <laughs> one. Um, but after three years, we considered it pulling out of the line. Um, it was selling, but it wasn't a heavy hitter skew. So um, when we were locked and loaded on the dashboard and started digging into our LCD products, we found that Glossy Boss was actually a super valuable product, and it would have been a miss, a huge miss, if um, we decided to pull it out. So needless to say, Glossy Boss is still in our permanent collection, and we even created a experience room around it in Nashville. So it's probably going to stay there for a while. That's awesome. How did you guys, were you thinking about lifetime value from the beginning? It was the main reason why we joined Castora. That's awesome. We didn't really have any visibility into that, no. That's really cool. I always get really excited when brands are thinking about customer lifetime value. <laughs> um, cool. So 
today, like marketers have so many tools, right? You have your ESP, you have your social media accounts, you have e-commerce platform data, all of this data siloed in different tools. Um, it can be hard, I think, to get this single view of the customer. Um, how do you guys balance all of that different data? Like, how do you cut through the noise? Yeah, I hate to sound like a broken record here, but I mean, we love Kastura because it makes this process easy. It really just aggregates all of this information in one place. And again, we're just such a small team that having that is, it's just a lifesaver. Yeah. And is it, which teams use Kastura? Our digital team uses Kastura, mm -hmm. which We've recently had um, a shift in that team, so we hired a new e-commerce director. Hey, Emily. Um, and I hope director. she's listening. Hi, Tanya, <laughs> if you guys are listening. Um, and they're fabulous, and, and we're just now really uh, kind of, there. I think it's been maybe three to four weeks that our digital and e-com directors have been together, so I think now we're going to start um, being folded into their conversations now that they have kind of a grip. Mm -hmm. That's really exciting. And how do you guys gather customer intelligence and turn that into insight, turn that insight into accountable marketing actions? Yeah, um, when we gather um, and are understanding who our customers are and where they're coming from, we have the ability to offer them a more personalized experience across our channels. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of how we're looking at it and what data we're covering. Awesome. So this next question, I know you can't talk too much about and it's proprietary. But I think this is one of the most exciting things about the Winky Lux brand, besides being um, a social media first brand. You guys are really known for revolutionizing the supply chain speed while still being a champion of clean beauty. And I think clean beauty wellness is everything these days. People are really paying attention to that in cosmetics. How do you uh, tell us a little bit about your prototyping and MVP process? How do you get um, these products to market so quickly? Well, I mean, for the most part, we like we try to be idea to reality within 45 to 60 days, which is a little crazy to some. Um, like you mentioned, we do have proprietary supply chain technology um, that allows us to make decisions more quickly. Um, so our prototyping rounds are limited to around two to three, um, <laughs> two to three rounds, which is great. We tr we try to get it right the first time, and then we put it on the most sensitive girl in the room and, and <laughs> we're like, Does, is this okay? Does this work for you? Um, but yeah, we are really sensitive to sensitivity um, mm -hmm. and reactions and things like that. Um, and we're lucky that we have this proprietary supply chain. Um, when it comes to MVP assessment, I think the store has definitely been an integral part in that and, you know, figuring out what works after mm -hmm. the fact and, and how do we create more products like this that, you know, are sticky, that, are tied to LTV. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, and are new products typically released generally, or do you send targeted messaging to your known high value customers for certain products? So since we're, we're so small, our new products are all general release, um, but we do send targeted messaging um, in other areas of our marketing. Thanks to segmentation on Castora. <laughs> There, is there anything, I know you mentioned um, the Glossy Boss, is there anything else surprising that you guys discovered when digging into your customer segments? I think that um, in the beginning we were having trouble identifying things like whether or not Paper Perfect or under eye concealer was really hitting the mark um, because these types of products, like complexion products, um, are often a slow burn. Uh, and that can be scary when you've bought into a lot of different tones and things like that. Um, and then I think Astora allows us to kind of see the life cycle of these complexion products. And we realized that the Paper Perfect, again, while it wasn't a heavy hitter um, in terms of sales right away, the LTV just continues to grow. Um, and so because of that um, information, we ended up coming up with Tinted Veil, which is our tinted moisturizer and our second complexion. You do. I love it. I'm wearing it now. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so the next topic I want to talk about is customer experience and how you guys focus on customer experience both online and offline. Um, you just mentioned you were just in Nashville for one of your new uh, retail experience pop-ups. Um, so there's an article we read on beautyinfluencers.com about the success of Winky Lux's uh, pop-up experiences. And it said that over the past six months, the brand has seen wide scale success with the stores receiving over 1 million social impressions per month, which is 
extremely impressive. Um, so is social media exposure typically how Winky Lux thinks about success metrics for physical retail? I mean, if it didn't happen on Instagram, did it even really happen? <laughs> um, so sure, social media impressions are fabulous. Um, we're still quite small and need all of that brand awareness that we can get. Um, but I think we viewed the retail stores more as an acquisition play, so the future of acquisition. Um, when we were first testing back in 2017, um, we tested with um, the edit at Roosevelt Field Mall. We found that people that were meeting us in person were three times more likely to return to our digital site. And after our first store opening in Soho in August of 2018, we found that 82% of the folks that came through and purchased were willing to give us their email address or text message. Oh, sorry, not text message. Their, their mobile phone numbers for text message. Mm -hmm. Um, and this still holds true. So um, I think that's kind of really the mark. I mean, yeah, social media impressions, great. Revenue, awesome. Mm -hmm. Acquisition, king. Yeah. And are you guys using texting as one of your marketing channels? We are. So we're on Attentive. Um, and they're one of our partners. Oh, well, I love that. <laughs> I, think that's I think that's probably why we're on Attentive, actually. I can't remember. It's been a little while. <laughs> but um, we do see amazing conversion rates, even though our, our list is a, a, a smaller than our email list currently. That's awesome. I have some lovely images right here. If you guys are checking out the slides, um, some really cool images from the store pop-ups. Yeah, that's our cashmere palette room. I love it. Um, cool, just a couple more questions. One more before we wrap up. Um, and I don't know if this is you who handles this, but how do you guys uh, decide where to open stores? Oh yeah, I mean, so we are looking at information on Costora mm -hmm. uh, to see where we kind of have like warm areas. I mean, we pretty much, we index pretty highly in the South. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just because that's kind of our girl. She's sassy, she likes makeup. She's not, you know, um, a complete makeup artist. Um, I mean, Soho was natural for us because mm -hmm. we're in New York. Um, Georgia, it was data that, that brought us there. Um, shopping data that brought us there. Mm -hmm. Nashville is the same. And then uh, in some cases, they were partnerships. So we've been partnering with Mace Rich and we have a little jewel box store in DC. I call it a jewel box, not an experience store um, because the entire space, it's pretty tiny, but the entire space is kind of like an experience. Mm -hmm. There just aren't any rooms. Awesome. And do you guys see um, a, a big overlap between customers who are shopping in store and online? Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually something that I really am interested in digging into more and more. I think that on paper, they do look the same, mm -hmm. um, but I'm curious to know if their personalities are the same. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm looking into consumer research tactics and surveying that we can do um, at the point of sale, rec like in person mm -hmm. um, to compare. Uh, I think that trying to figure out whether we should mirror our digital marketing and our retail marketing or differentiate between the two is a top priority right now. Awesome. So we are just about out of time. Um, thank you so much, Kate. And for everyone who's listening, um, Kate has to run back to work now. Thank you so much <laughs> for spending this time with us. But if you do have any questions for us, feel free to email me um, at maddie at castora.com. And if there's anything I can pass along to Kate, um, I'd be happy to do so. Um, we will be sending out the deck and recording. Uh, so expect that later today. And have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Maddie, and thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. Have a good one. Bye.